as information becomes available. Welcome, Wino. Sorry for the Ted Turner like start. Uh, it's not meant to be today or this weekend. I'm really uh, I'm just in a bad state. I was in a major <clears throat> depression uh, Friday and Saturday, and I kind of crowbarred myself out of it to do this today. I didn't really. Uh, happy Father's Day, everyone. Uh, mm-hmm. David, I was really touched by your Instagram post with your father. Um, wow, that was really, really sweet. Was that a Browns game, by the way? It was. That's the picture of me <sighs> almost passing out from heat exhaustion. Yeah. Uh, well, so it was like early September when they play yeah. in that really humid time in Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Holy yeah. shit. That's such a great picture. Really, really touching. Uh, yeah. Um, choked me up, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah. No, it's he. He, uh, my dad passed away six years ago. This it's weird because it's like, um, it's Father's Day. He died June 23rd of 2017, and then his birthday is like July 9th. So it's like a serious, and you know, I it's fine, it's all good, but like it it is kind of like one after the other kind of uh reminders. So yeah, it's it's kind of crazy, but yeah, no, he's it's. I'm I'm at peace with it. It's all good. So yeah. How old was he, if I may? He was 54. Um, so he had uh, glioblastoma, which uh, John McCain uh, passed away from. So um, yeah, he lived for like a good 18 months after his prognosis and everything. So we had time to kind of get closure and everything. And uh, uh, yeah, so Prepare you know, I mean, slightly. Exactly. Exa- yeah. yeah, I much prefer it that way than just you know out of no i have friends who their dads had like a heart attack and died out of no like there's no provocation yeah. you know, right so it's it's crazy uh, uh jesus christ god I mean, to say gone too soon is an understatement that's such a yeah. terrible uh and it looked like you were really close with them and i feel like you were or at least yeah what, your parents yeah. met in chicago they met in Cincinnati actually because they both went to UC and then they oh, right at college um, right I'm sorry yeah right, right, right. Yeah, no, no. and then they I was born in Chicago they were living there and um, then we moved back to Cleveland when I was probably six months old so yeah uh, happy Father's Day to your dad too Sarah I was looking at a picture of uh, John Christopher Depp senior maybe I'll show it now uh, why not right. Share screen. Uh, where is he? Where is he? Oh shit! Is that what? I, you know what? I so today is Just not meant power to be. Forward. I'm telling you. Just go forward. It's not meant to be. I had this thing saved. Uh, Jesus effing Christ! There's a picture <laughs> of Mr. Depp, and he looks like the picture I saw your dad. Um, and it was like him in a friggin' um, it was him in a Kentucky uh, Wildcats hat. It would appear, which you know how religious they are with college basketball in Kentucky. It's right crazy. Um, and somehow it just jumped off my screen. Just had it there waiting for me, and nothing's meant to be today. It's one of those days. I um I had a uh, Casey Kasem level fit before I went on. Of there was like a you know that Debbie there was a sound issues I all of a sudden yeah. I'm muted and I'm talking like just perfect until I go on I am haunted I am riddle I am cursed when it comes to computer issues yeah it yeah. is every F, you've heard me on gunk suddenly I sound like I'm uh, you know I'm Cha- Chauncey Hayden calling from New Jersey yeah <laughs> uh, welcome Babe Lewis si- yeah speaking of melon that's what I went through melon silent melancholic for two yeah. days straight. Uh, mental health, everyone. It is very, very. Um, hopefully, we're bringing a, a bigger awareness to it in the last few years. Um, and if you're having a depression problem or of any, st- have it. Uh, you don't need a psychologist, believe me. I think I'm. But, I mean, I don't mean. I mean that in a. There are people in your life that are. You know, you don't have to be Jason yeah. Seaver to uh, talk through it, but. Uh, even though I'm the, you know, I'm the Nicolas Cage of Ghost Rider. If you want to talk about it, you can try me. I'm not sure I'll get back to you, but you can try. If I'm in the mood, there's no better one to talk to than I. Yeah, I, I'm uh, <laughs> very ghosty. <laughs> to David, here back in eight months. A what? <laughs> here back in eight months. 
Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll arm, so. yeah don't count on it. Eight months. That'll be my new practices. Uh, <laughs> drinking coach and therapy in eight months. Give me a question. I'll get back in eight months. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not really funny, but yeah. so I was Alan Colic, one of my new names. Uh, one of my new favorite. Uh, I don't know. I think that's a real name. I think Silent Melancholic is the yeah. real name. Melancholic would be a great first name for a firstborn. Yeah, uh, totally. Thank, I think you're yeah, thank your you. firstborn. <laughs> Thank you for for joining us at such short notice. Oh, it's fine. I Thanks mean, for having me. I didn't really know what I know you got to leave early, but I come to get to this stuff. I'm not going to I'm going to do a very, very quick monologue preamble uh, because Lauren Marie went. <laughs> she did a rerun from what's happening. Bootleg uh, at the Sweeney Todd Broadway show. <laughs> I love it. Could you imagine Lauren with that rerun tape recorder and it drops <laughs> and the whole place goes on and uh, <laughs> Michael McDonald's going, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> With uh, so, jo Josh Groban. Yes, Sweeney Todd. that's why yeah. you're so essential for this first part. It yeah. just happens to line up that she went She went to New York to watch the Broadway of uh, rendition of uh, Sweeney Todd. Right. And <clears throat> Josh Groban is in it, and he plays the Depp role. And I want to do a side-by-side -side of the Epiphany, uh, Depp Epiphany song. Yeah. Welcome, Hooper. Smart as. Welcome. Thank you, David C., once again uh for your generous 10 spot as it were and everything else that you provide us which is incalculable a smith welcome sir there's lauren marie thank you lauren there's king cap it sucks and you have no father to celebrate anymore it does mm -hmm. king cap a lot of us are going through that um but there's some like my brother-in-law uh who is just about the best father i know on the with no bias at all, and my cousin Anton, who is like the Paul Westerberg of Warner Brothers and King of the Hill, mm -hmm. another great father. Happy Father's Day if you're listening. I don't know how often he lists. I like to have him on because he could. Did you know his one guy he worked with, uh, son went with to went with to elementary school with Jack Depp? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I don't know the name of the elementary school, so I saw him at a uh, this. Uh, I saw I was out there a few years ago and it's like the first thing I said to him and he's like what is this guy I, I hadn't even I barely said hello to him goes was your son in the same elementary school as jacked up <laughs> I swear to god in like 30 I'm psychotic psychotic <laughs> I mean, Listen, it was I'm a great sure. exchange. It was just like I, I didn't even say hello to the guy. And I'm right, like, right, right. You so you're the guy whose son went to fucking elementary school, jacked up. He's like, yeah. <laughs> how did you know that? And how did you know I'm from New Haven, Connecticut, or wherever? Right. I, Fairfield, Fairfield, Connecticut. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I love that. It's like, listen, I'm sure you're a nice guy. We'll get all the pleasantries later. <laughs> Tell me about jacked up. <laughs> So you're just like the perfect. Yeah, my dream Hollywood collaboration is my cousin writing something and you doing the musical score. Oh, I'd love it. That'd be amazing. Uh, that would be really you kind of remind me of him actually in a lot of ways. That's yeah. Hey Smith, I will email you if I need to talk. Why can't we just talk talk? <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody. Uh, it's amazing how um, technology is. You just I I must I must talk on the phone. If I did a comparison of how much I talk on the phone now versus 1995, yeah, I bet you it is 10,000 hours to one. I there are weeks it. where I don't make a single phone call. Everything is on text or email yeah. or doing this, doing this. If anything, I think a phone call is always an emergency. Like I never think it's just someone who wants to talk. Oh it's, yeah, if you see the phone yeah. ring, it's like oh you 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 drop your whole you're like oh what I'm gonna hear about it. What death. happened? Yeah, yep. right. It's right. That's right. So happy Father's Day to everyone in this <clears throat> chat who is a father. It is um, the the whole thing is like how the moms get this like five star restaurant and the dad gets a uh, Costco <laughs> barbecue in the backyard for three hours. <laughs> That's that Chris Rock bit bit about the dad doesn't can't get the big piece of chicken. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's. I love one thing I love about Chris Rock. He's very very like he loves to give his dad props. Yeah, proud black dad in Bedford Stuyvesant who took didn't leave his family and he right. he loves to emphasize that and I I, I love him for it. Um, <laughs> King Cap goes. I have a new phone plan where I only I could I, I have I I have a plan of. Phone call. Oh yeah, you have to plan it a week. Right, because the person doesn't trust that you would ever call them. That's right. That's right. 
or I need to spend a week with me, I'll snap him out of it. He'll push me off. I don't know what that would include. I'd like to have video of it, though. <laughs> Are you emasculating me, Sarah, with gay sex? No, but I, I would watch. I think, you, I think you're implying we're going to have gay sex. With <laughs> no, it's sensuous, whatever yeah. it is. He's going to push me off the Smith's Point Bridge, I think is what he's trying to do. Well, that'll certainly, you know. <laughs> that'll snap your spine out of it at least. Yeah. yeah. Then you have other Hoop. things to worry about. Hooper's <laughs> going down to Easter, Alexa. But tonight, Hooper's Nantucket bound. <laughs> He's like a huge fisherman, Hooper. <laughs> Gunga Din, welcome, sir. All right, let's get right into this. Lauren Marie, I want to thank you again for uh, your beautiful email and your rerun undercover work. Uh, Donna Brasco, I called her in the email. <laughs> Go to this Sweeney. This is an actual Sweeney Todd Broadway show with Josh Groban. The title Ooh. of this folder is Beachy and Pink Pop. So, AKA uh, Somewhere Sarah Will Never Be, the Broadway show. <laughs> You don't need to go, Broadway. Have Broadway. How about Broad? You said you were going to open up a restaurant called Cleveland on the on the on the ocean. I don't ever recall saying that, but it's a good idea. I'm going to have theme color orange and brown, and just play Browns games on go. a loop twenty four seven. So Sweeney. Okay, the title of this is um, Cycly Todd. Lauren Marie loves – Lauren Marie is the uh, – she is the cinephile of Saratoga, and <laughs> he loves Ronnie Cycli. So how about Ronnie Cycli replaces Josh Groban and uh, <laughs> Sweeney Todd? That's amazing. He's, he's a 6'11 center, David, who played for Syracuse. Who should, and then he, he's actually a really good NBA player. Yeah. Speak because of the Miami Heat, as you all know, were just in the NBA championship. He was a great center for the early days, the original Miami Heat. Jeez he was amazing. really good. He was like one of – there's a top-tier center, and then he would be in that next tier. He'd be like a guy who gets you like a modest double-double. And I didn't think he'd yeah. be that good. I actually thought he would suck in the NBA, but he was good. And he's like I, a really good-looking Greek guy. Like he's really like a Greek god of six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see him try to fit at that height through like the meat grinder. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's crazy i did this is just i, I don't know how it's amazing how things connect sometimes he went into music after the nba so he's like this crazy like james kennedy dj and you'll oh, see wow. a picture of it when i put so here we go thank you cindy lou who happy father's day to you as well i know you're abroad but you know what i mean happy <laughs> father's day to you and yours here we go so this is lauren marie's rerun copy of uh at the uh sweeney todd broadway show the actual few last week last week and uh, i so i juxtaposed it with depp i want everyone to, i want to compare josh groban to depp and that's one of the one of the many reasons david is here i can't believe the timing of this and thank you for being available so of course yeah This is Josh Groban, Dubby, singing, and this is on Broadway. This is okay. I'm gonna. David, have you seen Sweeney Todd on Broadway? I've seen a stage production when I was in high school in Cleveland, and then I actually played in the orchestra for one out here in LA. So I've, I've seen, I've mostly seen it on stage. The film, when we did the rewatch, that was only the second time I'd seen the film. Do you have that recorded? Um, I bet someone does. Uh, I would love to hear that. I really would. I would love to hear that. Um how how gay is this? Like, is there any is there any other heterosexual on the face of the earth right now doing a Sweeney Todd juxtaposition <laughs> on Father's Day? On Father's Day, I'm supposed Who, to be heterosexual and I'm doing a Sweeney Todd 
juxtaposition on Father's Day. Didn't, didn't your cousin sing uh, "Nothing's Gonna Harm You" to at his daughter? Yeah, like, how do you 16? remember that? Because you told you it on the rewatch. That? That was yeah. At a, yeah, my cousin Gary, who is kind of about twenty years older than me, really, you know, in a lot of ways, he's like a man's man. Loves pro wrestling, right. and every sport you could imagine, but he loves like Broadway show tunes at the same time. It's the craziest thing: classical so music and Broadway show tunes. Yeah. And he took the microphone and sang, nothing's going to harm you, not while Gary's around. And he got his daughter into, he's obsessed with Sweeney Todd. And I would love, yeah, Howard, Gunga Dingo's Howard Stern might be, actually. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, he might be. This is, this, this, actually, Howard makes this, this is Chuck Zito compared to what Yeah, it's, totally, yeah. Lauren Marie said, this is the same day as the Tony Awards. They left the show right. Th- That's crazy, Lauren. Oh, wow. So the Tony Awards is like the gay Super Bowl. It's like the right. gay. Gay Super Espies. Bowl Sunday. Yeah, gay Spies. Uh, God, there's actually, it's actually big stars in that now, it seems like. Well, I, I mean, they need uh, Broadway in order to survive needs to get like Jake Gyllenhaal as the lead and, you know, yeah. a, a show, you know, they're getting movie stars who you know, maybe they have the chops to do theater, but oftentimes it's, it's just a, uh, it's a gimmick to get butts and seats, you know? So, um, they all get nominated for Tony's now, uh, just like Hugh Jackman hosted, right? Like, right, right, right. Yeah. He sounds pretty good. It's a different version of like what Depp does. It's probably what like like the originals like this too. It's very operatic. It's very full voiced. Um, You know, Depp is as you point out doing. You know, he he and Bruce Whitkin uh, collaborated on creating that that Bowie sound. You know, Um, God, I love that you remember that Bruce Whitkin's listed in the (laughs) musical on in the credits. Well, he's also in that um, that interview. I think I mentioned when we did the watch along, like the behind the scenes documentary they made at the time when they made the movie. Bruce is being interviewed, so they were still on good terms and yeah. um, and just talking about. And I love that you retain the timeline of their falling out as well. <laughs> you know, it's because it, my 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 avatar there is from the book, the Skimmy Shelter book from oh. Depp's first wife, Lori Allison, who's been going back and forth with Kathy Scott and email right. and over the book and the pictures of the animals and stuff. But I know you're an animal lover. And so is Sarah. Uh, speaking of Sarah's animal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How cute is that cat? How cute is that cat, Camilla? That was Kathy Lee Gifford's only my pillow knows or Sarah filmed Camilla, uh, Taking a, you know, just rooting essentially to Kathy right. Lee for the music. Right. Yeah, and Kathy Lee gets the money from that video too because she put a claim in. No, oh, I did you? Sec- it's one yeah, sec- she did. Too short for that. That's way too short. It's short. No, no, that doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, she needs the money, right? Yeah, right. C- Camilla well, is Carnival mad Cruise that her. Isn't... Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Carnival Cruise isn't paying like it used to. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Camilla is brooding over the fact that her cat husband like cheated with a stewardess or something. <laughs> oh, oh Backdoor stuff. You both have great references there, Kathy Lee Gifford. Did you hear what Sarah just said there? That you remember that commercial? Carnival Cruise. Oh yeah. Hey, we got fun, Carnival yeah. Cruise. Hey, fun show, is that uh, the same thing? Yeah. Is fun. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Is that Carnival? Or is that something different? I don't know. No, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Hey, we got fun. Did you? Th- I don't want fucking Kathy Lee Gifford to hijack the show, but I mean, do you mean like think when she's a, she's clearly speaking of because you have such ties to this, yeah. she is clearly obsessed with Barbara Streisand. Oh yeah, well I mean she's, she's what she tries to do in her singing style and everything. Yeah, I mean she is. Um... She's obsessed with that kind of. She wants to be. She's similar. She reminds me of Mark Harris, quite honestly. <laughs> like she wants to yeah, be part yeah, of yeah. that old world, old showbiz world thing. And you know, with me, it's like an ironic thing where I just think it's funny to reference obscure movie stars from the '40s. But, um, but she genuinely, like any of her Christmas specials, she would have like Andy Williams and <laughs> yeah, you know, it's really like bad. all, all yeah. these uh, ancient, you know, uh, entertainers. 
and I, but it was genuine. She genuinely thought that's what America wants. They want to see me singing with, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm struggling for a name, something that would be a funny 1960s Dolly reference. Yeah. Not even, I mean, Dolly. Yeah. Do Do you know, Bing um, Crosby, right? That Bing Crosby. Of, or, right, yeah. Well, she, right. Bobby Sherman. There was one where, there was one where she actually wheeled out Gerald Ford in his glass case to, uh, <laughs> sing with him, I think, or sing to him. I don't remember, but that was one of our oh, friends. God. So that tells you where we're at here in history. Yeah, right, right, exactly. I would spend more time on mental health, but we're, we're against the clock here. You could actually tie Depp into mental health. Remember all the diagnosis he had at the trial with the oh. medications and stuff? It was crazy. It's worse than I thought. And even the, the Rolling Stone piece where they go into his depression and contemplating suicide, which I don't really buy, but yeah. That was you could tie mental health. We should do a depth mental health show at some point. Where I well, I think what's interesting about his mental health issues is I don't know anything about them, but I imagine it, that he has been saved by his charisma that, you know, um, his charisma has unlocked doors that he didn't even know were there. Um, to get along with difficult show business people or book jobs or whatever it is. And, you know, maybe that has left him feeling kind of like, gosh, I really haven't faced any adversity in a way that made me look inward and try to kind of build myself, my self-esteem up in a way that came from within, as opposed to just getting all these accolades and external forms of validation. Well, that's pretty brilliant. Uh, more than we deserve. Uh, and I'm jealous. <laughs> I didn't say that. For, uh, <laughs> there really is. I just, I've been going back and forth with the creator of uh not to brag of uh, of slug stalking. No, twenty one jump. <laughs> Patrick Hasberg and we were going back and forth about his charisma. Yeah, in a similar way. And uh, I don't want to like. We're just like I'm trying to kind of like you know set it up, and I can't stop throwing questions at him. I, I got to stop myself because I'm getting so. Yeah, you you need to wait until the actual session. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just building to more obscure. I'm quoting Stephen Cannell to him in the, uh, in the. I got to show you the exchange, though. You like it? I love it. Uh, I'm actually thinking about bringing you in to ask some questions if you want. Yeah. If you want, he's the creator of Twenty One Jump Street. He's a co-creator. Right. And he and Stephen Cannell create. He worked on the A Team. He was a producer on the A Team, and and uh, we have a lot in common, as it turns out. And the uh, we're gonna do the Jump Street interview that no one else has done. Go as deep and as far as you could possibly go, which the thing I've never been able to get the information I've never been able to. Yeah. And in general about Depp himself, casting him and putting him on the map and starting the Fox network and all that stuff. Well, and even the, the jump street that I was on last week and um, I haven't sat in in a while. So seeing how, like we were talking about how kind of bushy tailed and bright eyed Depp was in the first season to be there. And he's, and then to see him just kind of slumped on a couch delivering his lines <laughs> in the second season. That's very much part of the line of questioning. Right. Yeah. Just how, I mean, you, that happens with even people who probably have some kind of um, uh, depression where there is, there is sort of this, like, uh, it, it probably oh, was a good tie in there. Like you could see is like actual melancholy, right. Melancholic sink in and as sarah loves to say nine toes out the door right um, from season three and four and ironically or fittingly or uh patrick hasbrook leads the show after season two very larry david-esque yeah <laughs> right so that makes a lot of sense what you just said another brilliant statement uh, yeah. um, i want to give it before you move on here i apologize i want to give a, a a preview too of this interview that's gonna it seem pretty much a done deal. But uh, I was like, okay, what are we going to talk about? Oh God, where, where do I even go with questions? Oh God. And then you gave me a preview of what you're going to be asking. Amazing stuff. Oh, it's, wow. I, I was so impressed with the direction you're going with your questioning, Mr. Arm. Well, I cannot people, wait to see what did I say this again? interview. What did I, just, I'm not uh, saying anything. They can, they can listen to it. You're a fucking ball Don't ball. you spoil it either. <laughs> <laughs> I'll once. give you one thing. I'll give you one thing. Uh, and to me, this is like, I, I, this is, this has been plaguing me for 35 years. Um, the show has no setting. 
we talk about this right. all the time, David. Like, why did you not give it a proper city? Why did you not? What is this any town USA? This evergreen? What is it based yeah. on? You know, I'm gonna go into that. Uh, why it was never. Um, and the casting and Greco. I mean, I just yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. Enough. <laughs> that 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 question's plagued any fan of this show. Why right. do you not have a city, a proper city, represent represented? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can think of is that they they just wanted it to feel maybe the viewer to feel like you can project your hometown onto right. the show, and maybe you'll be a more loyal mm-hmm. viewer. Um, that was one the theory, and the other theory I had is they didn't want to make the a one individual city look at look like it was a shitty city that only crime right. came out of your city, only high school crime came out of Chicago, or right? Seattle, or which were the two guesses I had where when I was a kid, um, that it was set in because I kept you know going, what are they doing? I have another theory too. They have to go to a different high school every single week. And so to somehow uh, use like a real location and create this, I mean, yes, every, every uh, major metropolitan city has tons of high schools, but Jefferson, right, right, right. But they'd have, I mean, it's almost like, do you use the real names of those high schools or do you use the, like a fake name? Um, I don't know. Maybe not centering it in a real place uh, makes it easier to uh, set a a particular episode. You know, I'm not an expert on married children, but that was set in Ohio. I mean, uh, Illinois, right? Yeah. Okay. Chicago. Chicago. Okay. Right. So they, they were able to do it. Right. Yeah. And, and that's true. I mean, every other show, is set in a real place. I mean, every sitcom that's set in New York city or every, uh, you know, even, even shows like, uh, you know, Frasier is set in Seattle. It's set in not the biggest city in the world, but they, they were able to do it, you know, and still keep it, you know, I don't know. So, uh, again, this is Josh Groban singing Sweeney Todd epiphany and Broadway as per Lauren Marie and her rerun recording. Uh, you know, you're not going to get as pristine. We got it, Lauren, as far as yeah. I, I, anything you can get is more appreciated. And you can tell how good he is or bad, even in this, even if the yeah. acoustics aren't what you want it to be. And I'm going to put I'm going to play Depp after this. We're going to compare. Him. OK. Uh-huh. something inherently funny or just uh when someone just busts into singing opera at a no impromptu yes yeah. <laughs> i don't know what it is it makes me laugh every time even if it's like perfect like yeah like great opera like a plus i laugh every time i don't know what it is i think you need to like it, it's so hard to listen to any of these songs out of the context of the show because it is it is like an altered state where you kind of got to get used to the the fact that people are singing and then you you yeah. sort of buy into it. Now you had a brilliant analysis of what plays do, um, how people don't like them because it's not it's taking you out of the story and the the singing take. You know what I mean? Like you're not you're yeah. like oh god I can't take this seriously because they're singing and you know some people just can't <clears throat> buy into it. Well, and and this show is a little different just because there's very little talking in it. It's mostly singing, and so you do kind of you get used to that hot tub, you know, you kind of acclimate <laughs> to the temperature of it. Yeah. yeah. Very nice analogy. Uh, <laughs> David C. This is brilliant. Imagine if rerun on uh, what's happening had an iPhone for that Doobie brothers concert and how much better that would be. Oh, that's so brilliant. 
That's so funny. That's really David, funny. see, that's so good. So my question for you and Lauren Marie is how long is the play? Um, it's probably a two and a half hour show plus the intermission, you know, so, but stage time is probably two and a half, two forty five. Did the, what did the movie cut out that you thought was necessary? Um, they cut out um, the judge has a song that's really creepy because he's okay. kind of lusting after Joanna through a keyhole. Okay. And he's like, kind of, he's like, it's, it's framed that he's kind of um, like getting an erection watching her, but then he flogs himself with like a belt to, because it's, he, it's this weird sadomasochism song. Um, Aaron Andrews, you know, that Aaron, you know, the sportscaster, Aaron, a- a- a sideline reporter, I, she got I, I, filmed in a hotel room through a keyhole pretty much. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what that reminds me of. That's exactly. crazy. It's a really disturbing song. Um, it probably just, it was not, uh, you know, it, it kind of, th- there's some songs that sort of slow down the story going forward. Um, I'm trying to think what else was not. Don't worry about it. I'm just saying, I just wanted to know if if they had cut stuff out that disappointed. They they definitely did. They probably cut about five songs out of the Broadway show for the movie. Yeah. Lauren confirms two and a half hours. Um, uh, I, you know, I know nothing about, I mean, I haven't seen the play, but it seems like Tim Burton had a slot. Is it slavish? The word not slavish, slavish, right? Is that Mm -hmm. It's slave and slot. It's supposed to be like a different, you know, for, yeah, yeah. Uh, rendition of the movie. Like the, the movie, I don't think it it didn't take any liberties. What did get on screen, right? The- no, I mean, it's the the plot goes <clears throat> as the Broadway show goes. Um, I mean, the stuff that anyone would care about. It's it it's a good, um, you know, it's so hard to take a stage play and put it on film because you you have to do what they call opening up where you know, if the whole show take on stage takes place in one set, you have to find other locations for them to be at, you know, um, to, yeah, make the, yeah. to make the movie more interesting. Um, and so with the movie of Sweeney Todd, they did it, I think really well, because even in a song like, um, by the sea where Mrs. Lovett is like fantasizing about being married to Sweeney Todd and all the different locations that they would, you know, there's different set pieces that you can bring in if you have like, um uh fantasy scenes or or flashbacks even some of the flashback scenes um when his wife is getting raped by the judge at the party and point. everything that's you know. a great point uh th- this is your very favorite play right i mean this is it, it's one of them i mean I, I it i have it's it's right up there for sure yeah i i could t- i mean you were so passionate about steven sondheim uh, yeah. I have only seen two plays in my life, uh, two musicals in my life on screen. Um, Sweeney Todd and Cry Baby. And Cry Baby. <laughs> I swear to God, that's that shows you my depth street cred right there. Like, you, th- th- did you see Into the Woods though? Yeah, I saw Into the Woods, but I only watched his scene. And, his, uh, right, right. Okay, out. fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness he's right at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going through it. I'm like, where is he? I'm fast forward. Like, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? I didn't realize now that's a payday, right? Sarah, what did he get for that? Seven million for that one little oh scene? Uh something like that, yeah. Financial chart. hmm Lauren says the show is so good. I was singing every song. Wow, I love the now you gotta tape that for us, Lauren, so we can play it on here. You gotta tape yourself singing it. I love Sweeney Todd and Josh Groban is sure a heartthrob, which made it that much. You're gonna love Ronnie Cycli better, Lauren, when he sits in <laughs> and Cycli Todd when he replaces Josh Groban. I want to do an ab fab watch along with Lauren Marie at some point too. We want to- oh, she likes that. <laughs> that was a, that was a British show, right? That yeah. eventually comedy central took on exactly and played yeah. and replays. Right? I didn't know it from England. I just yeah. knew it from comedy central. Um, Go ahead. I, I was, I saw Josh Groban in a sushi restaurant in Los Angeles once. Um, and I think he was on a date, uh, with a much younger girl. She was probably 22. Oh, wow. How long ago is this? <laughs> this was probably seven years ago. Um, he's, he's probably in his early forties now, would you say mid early, mid forties? I'd say mid for mid to late forties. Okay. Yeah, probably. So, so he's probably 35, 36 then. And... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whatever. Was, yeah, no, I know. It was just you know, interesting. It, it was <laughs> obvious that right, that fifteen year age difference, right? As less do you think? I think you're gonna say a man. A man was there. 
<laughs> I was hoping you were going to say he was dead. Right. We're breaking something here. On the <laughs> Yeah, that was Lauren Marie by herself. That was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> clapping everything she has on her. That was really good. That was really good. It doesn't. I'm not Sarah. You've heard the debt part, right? So you heard that. I want you to keep it in your mind when we compare the two. I don't want no bias at all, please. I can count on you for that, right? No bias. Sarah, you let's see. Okay. <laughs> Lauren says, I love Ab Fab, love to do Perfect. it. There's Brendan with a Sable reference. John Nelson, wanna be Ronnie Sickly. That's so good, Brendan. I don't think we ever said that back then, Brendan. I think you just coined that. I don't ever remember making that comparison. That's really funny. Um, so here is Johnny Depp in, pl in Platoon. <laughs> <laughs> platoon the musical. Let's do Platoon the musical. Oh, God. <laughs> right? uh, I am private learner. <laughs> I, I love I love the notion of taking like Sophie's choice and turning it into a splashy Broadway show. <laughs> so this inappropriate. Is the wrong world. We shouldn't have been in Vietnam. <laughs> I'm the interpreter. I'm the only one that can speak Vietnamese. <laughs> Uh, so this is, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, present video file. Here we go. This is Depp in Sweeney Todd singing what you just heard. And we're going to compare yeah. and contrast the classically trained Josh Groban who's probably been singing since he was three years old. Yeah. And this is Depp who took on a impression of David Bowie. And I think no bias. He was absolutely brilliant in this role. And, and even so, you know, we talk about the underrated roles he's done. For, the guy got nominated for Academy Award for this, but somehow still this is underrated. Hmm. I, uh, I don't know, you know, yeah. you think, oh, that's, 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 that's appreciation enough. He got nominated for an Oscar Academy Award. No, I think it's still underrated. I still think people don't even know. Like Sarah hasn't even seen this until we yeah. watched along with it. People don't talk about that role of his. They always think of Edward Scissorhands or Jack, Jack Sparrow or yeah, yeah, they don't. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. And that this never comes up. I don't know why it doesn't come up. And it's a Tim Burton movie. Right. And he, look at how much watch this. He looks up looks like a Batman villain in the actual still shot here. Ready for this? Yep. Todd, you have to help me. Mr. Todd, please. Oh. Mr. Todd! Out! Oh! Before we get to the end of it, did you notice when Gro Josh Groban hits that note and he goes forever with it? You know, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Depp does a thing where he, he instead of hitting the, the extended note, he, he does like an angry thing. Yeah. And it compensates right. for the not hitting. And I thought that was a really great twist on it. Yeah. Just because he doesn't hit the note doesn't mean it can't be as good. And by yeah. the way, this is fair use because we are transforming content. Oh, I own everything <laughs> Stephen Sondheim. I did, did I just tell you? I just bought him out. And everything Tim Burton. And I own Sweeney Todd and all the rights. I own Warner Brothers and Bruce Whitman. Yes, we own Warner Brothers as well. All this shouting and running about. What's happened? I had him! His throat was bare beneath my hand. No, I had him! 
You hear that? Was there. That anger he does is great. That yeah. ang- that angry yell he does is really good, and I I don't think he gets nearly enough credit for that. He hits that sort of. I think it's like the brown cigarette pitch. You know? Yeah. And even that was you line... trying to get your headset to work. <laughs> I was. I was angrier than that. <laughs> um, and even the lines that he's not sh- uh, sort of shouting. Um, you know, his his natural speaking voice is so gentle that I think it adds an interesting dimension to the character where even though he's obs- this character is all about obsession and, and revenge and all of that, you see how someone damaged him first, you know? Yeah. Um, yes. And I think that that that's one thing about Depp's performance that I think really um, illustrates that point, because his speaking voice when he's not sort of projecting in that angry way is um is kind of it's gentle you, you feel like he's a gentle person has this ever been broached to sweeney todd fans in today's court system do you think sweeney todd could plead insanity and get off the murder if, um, if it was in idaho no because they don't have insanity <laughs> you really are the gunslinger sorry i could see how you take out i'm just uh, i'm just the, trying uh, to inform you <laughs> Uh, because he has a case, the trauma is uh, you right. know, wouldn't be crazy. Like, look at how charismatic he is here. <laughs> He's a serial killer for Christ's sake. Look at this guy, right? You're it, like, oh, I'm rooting for you, Sweeney. Kill the whole town. It would be funny if Texas Amber it would be self defense, right? Yeah, <laughs> it would be funny if Amber like stole defenses from Sweeney Todd when she was on the stand. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> she's so unoriginal and. Like, Oh, that's so funny. That's oh so that's God. funnier than it's Scissorhands <laughs> reference. That really is great. Uh, Nikolai Volkov can come. That's what all Broadway sounds like to me. I just I can't. <laughs> that's, that's, Nikolai Volkov is a is a Russian rest, pro wrestler, Debbie, and he used to sing the Russian national anthem before each match. Oh my God! That's why. I, that's how I know the Russian national anthem. <laughs> I know, I know. It's I have no other source of uh, knowledge from it than Volkov. Aaron, he'll never come again. Now, hush, love, hush. When? when? Why did I wait? You told me to wait. Now he'll never come again. There's a hole in the world like a great black pit, and it's filled with people who are filled with shit, and the vermin of the world inhabit it. But not for long They all deserve to die Tell you why, Mrs. Love, let's tell you why Because in all of the whole human race, Mrs. Lovett, there are two kinds of men and only two Am I the only one that gets the chills when, what would you call this, the crescendo in the next uh, verse? Mm-hmm. When there's the pause and he goes, "You sir, how about a shave?" Yeah, and he just—it's it, <laughs> it's oh, um, my, my skin is bubbling during this segment. <laughs> why? I hate everything about it. <laughs> why do you? Why? What's wrong with you? I hate Broadway. I, I the the talk singing in Sweeney Todd. I told you when we watched it. It's like just say it. Don't sing it. Yeah, I hate I hate it. But anyway, continue. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, Hollywood vampires. If I, no, one of the things I'm going to do, not only pick his scripts, but if I have to get involved with the Hollywood vampires to <laughs> rearrange their playlist, I would have them do this. Yeah, you do could. this. What What are you guys doing? Where's the creativity? Do this. Why can't they do this? Why can't they do a rock and roll rendition of this? I want to. I want to see if. I got to go through their like whoever's credited on the album of a Hollywood vampires thing. I got to see if I need six degrees of separation from any of them. Cause it's I, really I feel like basic bitch covers and it really is. It's like classic rock dinosaur rock basic bitch covers. It really yeah. is some boring choices. And I would rearrange that a whole fun. I'd be doing like Paul Abdul's cold hearted snake. And sh- it would right. be such a fun show. It would be so much better than what it is. And this would be one of the things I would do. Really, I really would. By the way, uh, David, I saw an interview with. Uh, this is, I'm psychotic. This my YouTube feed. <laughs> an Iowa State University 
uh, town hall with Peter Hedges came up, who's the writer of What's Eating Gilbert Grape, the book. Okay. And, uh, gonna go through that and see if he has any insight as to what uh because i know you love this you love the musical score in that like yeah that, beautiful yeah, score. it's really yeah. sad musical score there's the one staying put in his proper place and the one with his foot in the other one's face look at me mrs lovey look at you no we all deserve to die even you mrs lovett even i because the lives of the wicked should be made brief for the rest of us death will be a you know what I like about him singing too? He's very articulate. You could actually understand the lyrics. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. There's a lot of interesting words they use. And, uh, you know, I've never heard it in music before. The Soundheim writing the lyrics. He did the lyrics, right, for this? Day? He did, yeah. <clears throat> Relief, we all deserve to die. And I'll never see Joanna. Right no, I'll never. Right here, this is this gets me. Finished. All right, you sir, how about a shave? Come and visit your good friend Sweeney. You sir, too sir. Welcome to the grave. I will have vengeance. I will have salvation. Who sir? You, sir? No one's in the chair. Come on, come on. Sweeney's waiting. I want you, bleeders. You, sir? Anybody? Gentlemen, I don't the shy. Not one man. No. That scream was so good. That yeah. last scream. He goes, and he, he, a little bit of pitch in there, and he's got enough of uh, what bass or yeah. bravado. Also, the placement of the words, it's like off. Um, so getting into musical terms, but it's kind of That's off okay. the beat. Okay, arpeggiate and... away. That's okay. Yes, <laughs> it is. Um, it is actually syncopated, which means to fall not on the beat. Of course. Um, so because you can't predict, um, when he's going to speak or sing or whatever, um, it that can sort of catch your attention or give the goosebumps that you're describing. I yeah. Think. yeah. Well, there's dramatic. I don't know what's the what's the Shatner dramatic pause that that explodes? right. <laughs> What's the musical term for that pause? Is there a term for that? Um, uh, in in music, it's actually called a grand pause. So okay. there's a symbol called a fermata over the measure, which means that you hold it for you know the silence for a, an unmeasured amount of time, and then you know someone, probably the conductor or the singer, will bring you back in to s sort of surprise the audience. <clears throat> if you're going to learn a lesson from this thing, is do never arpeggiate your fermatas. <laughs> It never works. Only um, only Stephen Sondheim can do that. Exactly. Oh, no, ten men, nor a hundred can assuage me. Yeah, how many times has assuage been used in a song? That's what that's yeah. what I was thinking before when I was setting this up. Assuage. In a, yeah. I don't it... know if I've heard a song use assuage before. Sondheim is very literate and um, and is that that's part of his thing is finding like either big words or wordplay things. Good for um, him. That's a yeah. unique, uh, songwriting. Good for him. It's yeah. avoiding the cliches. I will have you. Get him back, even as he gloats. In the meantime, I'll practice on less honorable throats. And my Lucy lies in ashes, and I'll never see my girl again. But the work waits. I'm alive at last, and I'm full of joy. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. I mean, so it's a, good the way he hits that. It's like the origin of a supervillain. It's like the it's like the very origin story of a supervillain, the way his hits at the end. I bet you the Sweetie Todd's been I bet you Marvel or DC has used this as a super mm -hmm. origin inspiration. Not that I know of, but Yeah, I mean it, it's a it's it's a manic depressive episode turned into a song, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's 
Um, yes, yes. It, it just keeps so going cool. back and forth between revenge and we all deserve to die to the self pitying, you know, I'll never see Lucy again. You know, it's just, it's all over the place, you know. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Welcome, Kala. Yeah, I'm Sweeney Todd. He goes, I miss Sweeney. Uh, I, can you do a sequel? <laughs> <to this? laughs> Is it possible? Can somebody take liberties with Sondheim's? Uh, they could do like world. a next generation thing, like uh, um, uh, I don't know how they could. Sweeney Todd, yeah. the animated series. Yeah, just like yeah. Frankenstein his neck together and uh, send him <laughs> off on a new adventure. <laughs> new adventures. Uh, what the hell is it gonna say? What do you want to do? You uh, you you want to do Beachy Cold Cloud? Yes. David's here. Okay, so one of the things that plagued me throughout the Fairfax trial was this weird hanger on who appeared to be like in his late 60s and 70s, who was up Depp's ass walking in and out of the Fairfax trial. And it drove me crazy. Every day I try to look up and I kind of knew everybody else there. You're acquainted to the security guards. And even uh, Joelle Rich finally got she was tough, too. Right. Sarah finding her name out. Uh, yeah, but thankfully they came forward um, announcing they were a couple, basically. So all of the information on her came out. Which has not really been confirmed, actually, that they were ever a couple. I don't, I don't know if I yeah. buy the way that was framed. And, um, David, we know you have to go. So if you have to go, just. I, I got another 10, 15 minutes. So I wanted, I'll yeah, let you know. I wanted him to see this. Um, or do we want to do. Uh, or do you want to do. Lori Depp and Kathy Scott. Do you want to wait for later? Uh, it, you hit whatever button you hit. We will move forward. Let's, let's do let's do Beachy right now. Um. So yeah. So Joel Rich, who is one of his lawyers working with Adam Waldman in the Fairfax trial, we would see this kind of skeletal, attractive brunette gallivanting in and out of the uh, UK trial. I should say. Over and over again, I'm like, who is this? And she, she just, she never speaks. You know, she's just hanging around. She, she didn't. We read the transcripts. She's not in any of the UK transcripts, right? She's not. She's not interrogating anyone. There's no depositions. But she's just. It's the greatest gig. She's like this weird consultant who's just floating around and just with this stoic look on her face. And so with that, this guy, Beachy Cole Cow is there, but we don't know who he is. So time goes on, Fairfax rolls around and he's getting out of the SUV with him. He's, he's yeah. up his ass in, leaving the trial come, you know, leaves when he leaves. I'm like, he's got flip flops on and like, sweet, I'm like, what is this? It looks like a guy who a retired director who lives in Malibu, who hasn't done a film in like 10 years. Yeah. Just, I mean, I like, I couldn't, so I'm trying to, I had all these conjectures. And finally last week, Lauren Marie again, throws the name at me in the chat and somebody else in the chat, identify yourself. If you're in there said, just kind of like bluntly or just vaguely. Oh, I think he's his sober coach. And I'm like, well, that kind of makes some sense, but why does a sober coach need to be up his ass in and out of this trial? And mm -hmm. then, so we go look it up during the, it was like the, the five yard line of our last show and it's him and it's beachy cold key. I think is the name is so annoying. Like it's, it's got this Ireland pronunciation. Well, somehow it's spelled C O L C O U G H, but the seat, the last part it looks like it's cough, right? It's spelled cough. Right. Somehow it's key. Excited. That's how it's pronounced. God, is it irritating beyond anything? But nevertheless, I'm going to probably pronounce it 500 different ways. Yeah. Go on. I love that he's trying to remain so obscure that even his last name is unpronounceable. So you yes, can't remember him. Right. You, you can, right. Do guys like that ever cooperate? Like even the last <laughs> name, you can't pronounce it. Yes. So let me let me read. Let me give you a background as to who this guy is. Now, this goes back to 2000. So I kind of poking around and I'm going to read it here. But apparently he is a celebrity therapist who appeared on Dr. Drew's celebrity rehab at some point mm. or another so this is an article on him from 2006 and he's a very very shady character and it's a good thing amber heard's people rotten born and bredahoff did not throw this in their face because it ain't pretty what his background is right <clears throat> okay you see do you see this uh, yes okay 
Celebrity therapist Beachy Colcott seduced us too by Helen Waters. This is 2006. With, uh, okay, so the, I guess it's a quote from the top. And sometimes I don't know what to read with these things, the way they're framed. Let me start. Yeah. With, so with soothing new age music, tinkling in the background and heady fragrance from a smoldering incense stick filling in the air, tears streamed down Janet Bell's face as she talked about her emotional problems and innermost fears, sitting in the plush Harley Street consulting room of celebrity therapist Beachy Cole I hate his name. Cole Clee. Janet felt reassured by his gentle, sympathetic presence and soft Irish voice as she opened up about her eating disorder and binge drink. With illustrious reputation, she trusted him implicitly, and if truth be told, felt a little in awe of the man who'd famously helped an array of celebrities with their addictions, such as Elton John, Michael Jackson, Ro I don't know a lot about Robbie Williams, I always see his name, hmm. and, the fuck he is. and it gets better, Paul, not this guy, Paul Cas Cascone, <laughs> and comedian Caroline Ahern, I know who that is, oh, and here we go. How did we book Kate Moss for the trial? And model Kate Moss uh, is one of his patients. The warm hug at the beginning of and the beginning and the end of each long hour session felt comforting. And when after six months of therapy, he offered to massage her shoulders. This is getting rid of, she, he's like the Weinstein of celebrity therapists. Right. The but back in 2006, like it wasn't framed that way. Yeah. Right. Right, and there was no Me Too movement yet. That's what I'm saying. Which, is like it, this article could be written from a slightly like, yeah. Then, <laughs> as you can imagine, listen, this is the next line. And now she complained about a back problem, and she agreed. <laughs> Within a few weeks, the shoulder massages had given way to something far more intimate. When he asked her to lie in her cushions on the floor so he could oh. massage her back and legs, telling her this help. Build intimacy and trust. Oh. <laughs> you know, you're gonna use that. I think I think if you lie in my uh, my cushions and afford to help build some kind of intimacy and trust, <laughs> stop stealing my moves. <laughs> if you don't say that in I in like with an Irish brogue, you can't right. pull that off in any. Uh... <laughs> A month after that, he suggested undoing her bra straps, oh. then hitching up her skirt a little, because well, they were in the way. No prizes oh for God. guessing the rest of the story, by the way, especially following last weekend's revelations in a red top tabloid. This is 2006. This article's from twice okay. married, twice married Cole Klee, who at the time is 58. So do the math. He is now 73 hmm. at 17 years to that. So yes, it's seven, whose wife of 17 years, Joe is also a therapist, of course, indulge in sex sessions with former lap dancer, Angela Harvey, who oh is God. now, let's do 17 plus. She's now, this woman is 48 now. She's yeah. 31 then. Whom he was treating for alcohol addiction. Lurid text messages. Were, were you texting in 2006? Uh, no, I probably I probably couldn't afford the minutes that I needed. Yeah, to. it was like, <laughs> yeah. hey, expensive. In the course of a bucket six, of 10 messages a month. <laughs> he, he was texting before this. I wonder if the therapist can write that off at the time. Like it's like you can text right. therapy in the course of her six month therapy. She claims he sent her lurid text messages and a camera phone picture of himself. Wow. With his little beachy naked and conducted in an affair in his office, eventually leaving Angela feeling humiliated and used. When it became clear here earlier this year, he had no intention of leaving his wife for her. Now it would appear this is every therapy clear. I mean, I've seen porn movies where this is exactly the plot. Like, it's, uh, it's, this is like this is so every cliche in therapy. Now it would appear that every violation of their ethics, you know, now it would appear that Harvey isn't the only woman to feel humiliated by Cole Clee's touchy feely brand therapy. Two more women have come forward to describe to the male their disturbing experiences with the respected author and one time GM. TV fable rot. I live out of the Brits, but the U, like Canada does with the U and the, right, right. One of them, Janet Bell, is filing a complaint with the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy (BACP), which bans sexual relationships between therapists and patients as an abuse of trust. 
Last night, the BACP refused to say if Cole Claw is under investigation, but confirmed that any member found guilty of inappropriate relationship and patient can be suspended, made to re they have to be retrained or expelled. I would imagine they'd be expelled. Although this in itself could be not stop a therapist practicing outside of its organization. So not a good week for Cole Klee, whose glittering career and marriage are now being threatened by the claims of these three vulnerable women who went on to seek help for these deep-rooted problems. What a reverse for the man who was the star's shrink as he was young, yet professed to find a greater satisfaction helping Joe Public a man who seemed to have conquered his own addictions in triumphant fashion and whose experience gave a unique insight into others' demons. Born, oh, look at this, it gets, look at this, I, mean, I don't know if you can follow along here. Yes. Born B. Champ Owen Colkley in Belfast in 1948, one of eight children of an alcoholic Roman Catholic tailor, Beachy was addicted to drink by the age of 14. The next 20 years passed in an alcoholic haze as he pursued a career as a drummer, of course, in an Irish band. Oh. See, all, all Death needs is drummer in an Irish band and right. alcohol. <clears throat> enough for him to love this guy. Yeah. Reduced him to be down and out. His epiphany, no Sweeney Todd, mm. uh, pun intended, intended, came one morning when he woke up under a lamppost to find a dog urinating on him. His first marriage of produced two children collapsed. Realizing he was at rock bottom, he started to go to AA and then went to Broad Reach House, a drying out center in Plymouth, where he later retrained as a therapist. Could, that's a pretty cool system they have, right? You just pass out, have a dog piss on you, and you get to become a therapist. You don't need college. You don't need grad school. You could just become – can anyone do that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, apparent. I mean, it sounds like Ben Affleck going to promises in Malibu. Like, oh yeah, we'll forgive you. Come back yeah. to showbiz. <laughs> what? Well, that's you can't do that in America. Only in Ireland could you just become a therapist without any no grad school, nothing. Just, hey, here's your... he now has been sober for 22 years, and by all accounts, an intuitive, intelligent, charismatic counselor. I bet. He was extremely well regarded in his promised recovery center in Kent and was here and he met it was here that he met John Reed, Elton John's former manager who was emerging from a long history of drink and drug abuse. Reed <clears throat> introduced him to Elton at a party and the rest is history. So Sarah, I want you to hearken back to the transcript we read. You remember the Elton John part from uh, I'm I'm weak on Elton John, so you're going to have to lead me through it again. First of all, thank you, Cindy Clausen. Great to see you in here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, smartass. How dare you forget me? I was the one who guessed it was Depp's. Thank you, smartass. I didn't, I couldn't, can, I can't, thank you for IDing yourself. I'm glad you did. I'm humbled. Um, I couldn't look like, man, how much do I have in this walnut-sized brain of mine that I can remember? Every comment and every chat, and, but I please thank you for identifying yourself. It was Smartaz who said that he was the sobriety coach. <clears throat> Lauren Marie, thank you, thank you, thank you for your rerun boot iPhone <laughs> bootleg. <laughs> Todd and Broadway, that was so Don Nebraska of you. And thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad it and made, it made our day. Go ahead, sir. I apologize. Let me get this out of the way. I did not do it in the beginning. I appreciate you all for the super chats. Thank you so much. If you can, please donate via super sticker, super, oh God, what are they called? Chat, yeah. super thanks. <laughs> um, and join us on patreon.com slash forever. Thank you. All funds go, everything we net, goes to the ARM fund. Thank you. She uh, She's bullshitting because it really goes to this cartoon. To the beach. So until the Lakers either develop, and this is my thing, guys, and this is as a coach in an organization, you got to be. <laughs> I love that cartoon cat. So, oh, so cute. So <clears throat> and and I, happy Father's Day to her little father, whoever he may be and wherever he may be, whatever alley he's roaming through, knocking oh. up other cats. Happy <laughs> Father's Day. You think Camilla's aware of this? Like the father, not that, you know, like does she, does she know her father? Does she miss her father? <clears throat> no, I am her mother and her father. That's all she needs. <laughs> I, by the way, that was the golden tones of Sam Mitchell from NBA Radio in the background. I love that she was listening to that. I, I don't have <laughs> any idea he's on this. I love that. I know. Guy. And the context is I had just gotten home with groceries. I put them on the counter, of course, as people do. And I had NBA Radio playing in the background. And she started opening up cabinets like she tends to do. 
and I had to get it on video. <laughs> do all cats? So that looks pretty sophisticated move for a cat. <clears throat> She's do they a very smart little girl. Look at this. Look I have this no idea. I only care about my To the beings. So until the lake of either develop, and this is my thing, guys, and this is as a coach in an organization, you got to be. May I say, let me compliment myself on how clean those cabinets look. Thank totally. I was, I was I was thinking, I was like, did you buy the model? <laughs> no, I, I had just moved in. So that's the okay. only reason. There's nothing like that now. Um, yeah, hey, guys, I, I'm sorry. I probably have to run. But um, oh, thank no. you. Thank you for having me on, though. This is always, always a pleasure. Always, always. Thank you much. David, I cannot thank you. Not least you got, I mean, you were really the Sweeney Todd segment was you were essential. No, that yeah. was perfect. Really can't yeah. do that without you. Yeah, and thanks. I wasn't going to contribute anything. So thanks for being here. Of course. The <laughs> so yeah. last thing, Debbie, last thing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. This sure. guy, so this guy, Elton John, hooked Depp up with Beachy. Uh, oh and uh, through the UK trial that we read, it was constantly innuendoed, oh, Elton John helped me find. And so he would write, have this exchange going back and forth with Elton John and people. And so he, this, it's clearly hooked up from Elton John and Kate Moss for Christ's sake. It's, you know, that's how Kate Moss was booked for the, I was like, how did you get right. Kate Moss? That's how they got Kate Moss. Um, my last um, observation about Depp's mental health is, you know, when we talk about like, he has the worst taste in hangers on and friends and, yes. and, friends and all that stuff. Like I said earlier, if he, if he has sort of only had a life of green lights because of his charisma, um, maybe he's trying to vicariously live through people who have uh, demons and are troublemakers and are uh, do face adversity because of their consequences, uh, because of their actions, they face consequences. Um, and he somehow sort of gets some sort of human frailty feeling off of that. I wonder if he that has outlaws to do with too, Debbie. He's obsessed with yeah. the outlaw. The person who um, sticks a finger <clears throat> to the man, or like Thompson and Brando, I kind of get it. But then you go over the line with these creeps, right? Well, like the, right. the tattoo guy too. What's yeah, his name? Right, right. Jonathan Shaw, right, Sarah. That's a bad one. That's yeah. a look at his rap sheet. Holy, did you see that guy, Debbie? Remind me of his he's rap sheet. He's a celebrity. It's always a celebrity <laughs> tattoo artist, and he got this gun running charge that Depp bailed him out of oh, drugs God. running, gun running, crazy, crazy crimes of like, yeah, literally like importing guns from like South America in this Jesus. transcript. And Depp, Depp threw at him what was it, Sarah? Five hundred grand for legal yeah. fees. Jeez, mm -hmm. that's crazy all right, right guys song parody man of the depth world right exactly all, all right, right i'll be you. in the chat thank you guys right. so much i will okay. see you soon see you soon bye thank you super have a thank you hooper have a sweet and low splendor <laughs> weekend yourself sir Speaking bath water's on the way hooper <laughs> are you gonna send the bath water i'm sending him a uh, a case uh, okay, so back to this article here. So Elt, after Elton publicly sang Beachy's praises and agreed to write the preface for a self-help book, the effective way to stoop, stop drinking. <laughs> Celebrities flock to Cole Clee's door, even the Hollywood, Elizabeth Taylor, Sarah, are you who you love? And I don't. Um, <laughs> she... <laughs> you want me to talk about Elizabeth Taylor? I can for at least Depp two hours. And her had a, Depp and her had a friendship in the 90s. Did I ever I'm tell you? Sure. I think I told you about it. There's an article where he talks about a lunch he had with it was Steve Martin, Depp, and Bill. I, oddly enough, Billy Bob Thornton went to lunch with Elizabeth Taylor at the same time. She and always, like, Elizabeth Taylor, I'm not saying this of Depp, of course, because I wouldn't, but he, she always surrounded herself with like the freaks of the day. So everywhere she would be spotted out in public, it was always a freak show. Like right. Michael, Michael Jackson, Liza Minnelli. He's coming uh, David, whatever, Liza Minnelli's gay husband. Uh, but yeah, those were her friends. And it was Mickey Rooney. It was just being so traumatized as a child. Right. She just didn't know how to relate to normal people going forward. Speaking of MJ, even Hollywood star Elizabeth Taylor once phoned him to see if he could help her dear friend Michael Jackson with his addiction to prescription drugs. I didn't realize that he was addicted to prescription drugs. Are you kidding? He yeah. Had so I, many I kinda... addictions. I kind of tried to ignore him in the later years. Well, I, I get it. I, I have like a 500 page biography on Michael Jackson that I've read like three times. 
but his addiction started after um, he unfortunately put too much hair product in his hair and uh, caught on fire during a Pepsi commercial. Yeah, so that burns out. So he got a, he got addicted to pain medication, and it went forward from there. Where do you stand on the pedo stuff with Corey Feldman and oh. all that? Smoke fire. Yeah, totally. I I'm with you on that. Yeah. I'm one of those, and I, I know unfortunately in in the Twitter Twitter world with the wives, uh, if you're a big Johnny Depp supporter, you have to be a supporter of Michael Jackson. I will never fall into those lines. Never. I believe it. I don't. It, it, it's not a tell him, it's sister. A fall. You there? You cut. You, okay, go ahead, go ahead. I think you were cutting on me, or it was me. Oh well, okay. I believe it. Yeah, I'm. I'm the smoke fire thing. I'm all for that. Whether it's Dan Schneider or, 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 or MJ. I mean, with with Schneider, we have some proof now too. With uh, what's her name? Goddamn! Why do I keep forgetting her goddamn name? Smart chick from Nickelodeon. Um, they had it in the Johnny Bye Bye. McCurdy. Yes, thank you, Jeanette McCurdy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She's uh she's all over it and stuff's leaking out. Thank God. Um, yeah, I the smoke fire thing. Who do you know who's having jammy parties with Macaulay Culkin and 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 and, and, uh, and secret uh, rooms and, with alarms in the or, house? Right. Yeah, it just it doesn't it doesn't it, you don't have to be. Uh, uh, you don't have to be um, uh, uh, Inspector Aberline to figure this one out. Who's Inspector Aberline, Sarah? From From Hell. Oh, all right. That's the character in From Hell. I know you haven't you haven't seen From Hell, right? I know. I was like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I should have just got. I should have just went along with it. Inevitably, given Cole Clee's uh, own newfound celebrity, which he appeared only too eager to capitalize on, people started to wonder if fame was his new addiction. Now, one could be forgiven or wondering if there might also be an addiction to women. Uh, I wonder. If, like Angela Harvey, secretary Janet Bell is an attractive, petite, curvaceous woman, the daughter of a self-employed businessman, secretary. She grew up in Buckinghamshire. How many? After, look how long that is. And I today know, she lives, I can never say that properly. Buckinghamshire or whatever. I had, I had to come to a dead stop to read it before I could just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I could cruise through this and then I get to that and I have to go. Book topics thrown into one tapping in Beachy Cole Clee's consulting room that she refuses to even be photographed, although she is happy for her name to be used during this. When she first, when he first suggested massaging my shoulders, I did feel vulnerable, but thought, "Hey, it must be okay." If that's what he says, I trusted him. Says Janet, now 38, who first met Beachy when she was admitted at the age of 22 to the Promise Recovery Center for an eating disorder. She spent six months there. Uh, as a residential patient and felt feeling that Cole Klee, then the director of the treatment, had helped save her life. She started seeing him again in 99, seeking help with her big... Up. I think we lost arm. Hold on. Okay. Hold on, folks. Nope. If you can hear me, arm, I think we lost you, so come back in. If you can hear me, you're not on the show. You need to sign back in. Add yourself back to the stream. Okay. Can you? I cannot hear you, Mr. Arm. Hold on, folks.
If anybody can hear me, we will be back shortly. We are working on a technical issue. Back in a minute. Sarah, can you hear me? Sarah, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, it's just not meant to be today. I told you that from the very beginning. Thank you, Sue Monster. Yes, thank you, Sue Monster. There. Not meant. Did we crash? It took for. What's the last thing I said? Do you remember the last thing I, I said? I don't. I don't know. I apologize. Um. Michael Jackson and Michael Jackson took us down. So let's skip Michael yeah. Jackson. Uh, but we were reading, you were reading you the Beachy thing. thing. Um, we're calling him a pedo and we had that conversation and, um, uh, I'm trying, I, I hate that. I, I kind of was going into the woman who was, Okay, let me let me go from. I think this is where we are. He made. I'm not even going to put it up because I think it slows down. I think the Daily Mail is such a high bandwidth, and there's so much, so many ads flashing. Yeah, let's there's just, so many ads. Let's when just you, talk about it. I'll just read it from here. Okay. She started seeing him again in '99, seeking help with her binge drinking, bumping into him at the tube station. He made me feel that I was the only person who could help me. He was so charismatic and caring, saying this: "There's something very special about you." There's something very special about you. Look at you sort it out. And then when he started touching me more intimately during the massages, I thought, oh, my God, I was so embarrassed. Afterwards, nothing was said, and I left quietly. I trusted him so much that I never questioned it. The change happened very slowly. If it had been our first session or if I hadn't known him before, yeah, I would have questioned it. But the fact that he had saved me at the treatment center a few years earlier meant that I didn't doubt him at all. After about a year of therapy, we had sex. For the first time, I was lying naked on the floor. Makes picture this scene. I was lying naked on the floor on a big square cushion in his office after he was massaging me, and he just did it, and I just didn't try to stop him. I should have ended it right there and then, but bizarrely, his wanting to have sex with me made me feel special opposed to his other patients. I was so in need of affection at that time, I think I would have taken anything. Also, part of me, I'm ashamed to say, felt a little excited that Beachy Colclee, therapist to the stars, wanted to have sex with me. When he used to tell me about the famous people he mixed up with, and I'd think, wow, I'd have the same therapist as so-and-so. So he would tell me what his celebrity clients had told him, and he would breach their confidentiality, saying to me, I'll tell you this because you're such a special person. <laughs> his normal rate was, I don't know what British conversion is, but it says 120 an hour. So I don't know what the hell that mm -hmm. means in uh, America, which is famous. What famous people that might actually have paid him, but he only charged me 25. So when we started having sex, he would tell me I didn't need to pay him at all. At that point, he even paid my <sighs> cab fare so I could visit him, which made it even more difficult to break away from this. We'd have sex in every session from here on in. I'd go in, we would chat for five minutes, 10 minutes. And he says, Oh, do you want a massage? And then we didn't have, we had, and then after this was never any sort of passionate embrace. We kissed only once and looking back, it was horrible. Indeed, the way Janet tells it, the sex was rather perfunctory and I've never heard sex <laughs> and clinical with Beachy dispensing his advice throughout a normal voice as if she were still sitting in the chair opposite fully clothed. When I thought she was going to go somewhere else with that dispensing <laughs> comment, but anyway. When her hour was up, she had to leave on that dot. 
Never a minute more, says <laughs> Janet. At first, I believed it would evolve into a proper relationship. Although we would be going out for meals at this point and shopping together, the whole package, I thought. I thought uh, I would be kept as a mistress. And I'm ashamed to say, I never even thought about his wife the whole time. He would <sighs> promise me things such as, oh, you must come to my house for the weekend. Adding that we would make love in his big brass bed, but it never really happened that way, did it? The only oh thing he ever God. bought me was some underwear. This is like Dr. Kipper shit, right? A yeah, bra my little nighty. <laughs> and two garish lacy g-strings i never wore them though once i said i wasn't coming back to any for any more of this because of the sex he called me up and coaxed me back in i did ask on a number of occasions if we could go back to just being a therapist and patient how about that but he didn't listen to any of this sometimes Is that I possible no there's no going back to that you couldn't look at it the same there's no this she know i mean he knows it she knows it and how many just like her that we don't know about Right, that just wouldn't even. Yeah, the, that I is mean, some shady shit. Uh, this is just this is this is like the Weinstein of therapists, right? This is a casting couch. This is just a therapy version of it. Sometimes I'd cancel an appointment, but something bad would happen in my life, and I'd go back. Once I was in tears because I wasn't getting on with my boss. Getting on means in British, I guess. Like get, oh, getting getting along. along. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's a weird uh, uh, turning of phrase. Beachy's response was to say. I know, I know it'll make you feel better. And then as we made love, he said, I bet your boss your boss wishes he could do this with you like I am. <laughs> I bet your boss wishes he could do this with you like I am. He took a photo of me and kept it in his drawer with pictures of other girls, which I thought was a bit strange. Eventually, the sessions were so damaging and unfulfilling that when I left his office... I'd go get some wine to cool out, even though I was seeing him for drinking problems. Oh, my God. The irony. I never mm -hmm. got sober. Imagine that. The whole time I was seeing him. For about six months after we started having sex, I took an overdose of Valium and alcohol because I was so depressed and unhappy. I was rushed to the Chelsea Westminster Hospital. Luckily, I didn't need my stomach pump because I'd been sick. The day after that, I'd phoned Beachy, and he told me to come to see him immediately. I bet. I arrived at his office still feeling horrendous and quite wobbly. All I wanted to do was talk. But after 10 minutes, he said, oh, I know it'll make you feel better. And then instigated sex. Vulnerable. <laughs> now in the cold light of day, I wonder what on earth I was doing. But all I can say is that he was very seductive, and I was very vulnerable. I knew it shouldn't have been happening, but I didn't feel strong enough to get out of this. It was totally degrading. And then one day at the end of 2002, I began to think, I can't do this anymore. It's hurting me. I, w I just wasn't getting well. I was being used. The realization was like a flash of light. I texted him to say I wasn't coming back, and I never heard from him ever again. <laughs> Janet, who is now sober, adds, I had a male counselor after Beachy, and I found that just too difficult to have a male. I just mm -hmm. hate that. I just sat there wondering if he wanted to get me into bed, staring at him the whole time, and I just couldn't do it. So now I've worked through a lot of my issues, and I came out on the other side. Uh, I feel Beachy took advantage of me when I was ill, and I believe that is how he treated me and was held back my recovery for years thanks to him. Sarah Jones, a 33-year-old professional woman living in Brighton, this, again, this is 2006, said, I felt so humiliated about this therapy that she prefers not to use her real name. She went to see Beachy Colkley three times in 1994 for help combating an eating disorder. And then five years in, her marriage was in trouble. It was my mum who first phoned me. Mum. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know how it goes. To see if he could, <laughs> that's like saying mum to um, Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. Who first beachy to see if he could help me because she'd seen him on TV a few times. She was in despair and thought he could help me because uh, he'd been through so much himself. I had anorexia in my teens and then bulimia, which was triggered again when I was 21 after a traumatic breakup with a boyfriend, says Sarah. When Beachy hears anorexia and bulimia, Sarah, he thinks, oh, my God, model chick. You know, he thinks my he end. looks at the body. Yeah, that's his, uh, well, Kate Moss is going there, right? Why do you think? Mm -hmm. Can we put two and two together there? I doubt. I don't think he would have been brazen enough to attempt, looking like the goblin he is, to put the moves on Kate Moss. We'll never know, actually. And the the bulimia and anorexia makes a lot of sense when you put it. 
I went to see him three times and something just didn't feel right. I didn't feel comfortable, although I couldn't put my finger on. I bet you he did exactly what I did. <laughs> again, despite this, Sarah contacted Beachy again when she was 28 after having sexual problems in her marriage. At times of her stress, her eating disorder would resurface, but the root of her problem this time was that she felt unloved by her husband. That's where Beachy swoops in. I want mm -hmm. to see again thinking that before I'd simply been too young and this time I'd been more amenable to help the first appointment which cost whatever this this British translation is 35 dollars was fine I don't know what that is I would love to know what the translation is it was fine and we felt I got on quite well her he was supportive and encouraging and I felt quite positive he mentioned massaging me now and told me next time to bring some clothes I felt good in Something a bit sexy or sensual, he said. <laughs> he said. He said it was to help me feel confident about my body. Although I didn't have a body image problem somehow, my eating disorder was a, contr a control mechanism for me, not about how I looked. My second appointment, I saw the first signs of smarminess in him. The whole way he works is to say that you and he need to form some kind of intimacy. He told me, I got this form of therapy for you. It's a little more relaxed. You, ju you just feel more comfortable with your body the way I do it. Sarah had taken along, uh, Sarah had taken along as requested an outfit she felt good in, an elegant red evening dress, even though Beachy had mentioned Another client who turned up in a short skirt, he suggested I wear the same, stockings oh. and high heels. I kept my clothes on, and I felt him massage my shoulders, but that was it, she says. I felt quite, it felt quite seedy, um, but I thought he was yeah. obviously, he, but I thought he obviously knew what he was doing because he had celebrity clients. He clearly knows. What oh, he's honey. Doing. Oh, honey. <laughs> I felt like I was on a psychiatric ca uh, casting couch. Oh, wow. I just said that, that I made the wine scene and she's saying it. This is a long time ago, too. This is very before. Uh, this is seven. This is, oh, God. I want to say uh, 12 years before the Me Too generation hit. I felt pressured into it, but also made me feel like I was insulting him by even thinking that. I think his trick is to make people feel stupid for even protesting it. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing. On mm -hmm. her third and final appointment, Sarah decided against her better judgment to give the full massage a go. She changed into a long green halter neck dress and nervously laid face down onto these cushions. He said, what are we doing? <laughs> I'm wearing a cricket box in case you get aroused, which I felt was a very inappropriate thing to say, but I lay face down on the floor, not wanting him to feel insulted again by my reluctance. He was massaging my back, getting close to me, and then he said he wanted to massage my front <laughs> and asked me to turn over. I told him I wasn't sure about what was happening now, but he said I had to relax and we needed to be more intimate. We had to get to know each other to build a trust, but I refused. So I fled after this one session. I couldn't wait to get out of there, but I was too embarrassed to say anything. He looked a bit sheepish, and I never went back again. He never called me again. I considered uh, reporting him to the BACP, which I thought, it's Beachy Colkley. He'll never believe me. Is he a therapist from the start? <laughs> I thought no one would even believe a woman would have these types of problems. He is revered as a savior in this community. And I was just an ordinary woman with emotional issues. I felt disgusted with myself for falling for his words to the extent that I did, compounded by guilt for not saying anything sooner. The experience put me off going for help for some time after that. Someone else afterwards, but in that itself, it had been a positive step for me because it got me off of him into a better therapist. I thought, if the therapist to the stars can't fix me, then I've got to fix myself. And that's just what I've done. Beachy Colkley was unavailable for comment. Now, the next time you watch the Oscars, imagine these people getting up there and preaching to you what you've done right in your life and what you need and what you've done wrong and what you need to do to continue properly on this earth. These are the people they surround themselves with. Sarah, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. It appears I'm having another fucking Google Chrome tab delay like last time. Uh, I can't switch tabs. I can't look at the chat. I'm speaking. I can hear you, yeah. No, I, well, I can't hear you right now. 
and I can't. Okay. Okay. I hear you. I hear you. You heard the huff or no? Mm, yes. Yes. I heard that. I'm getting an hourglass. I'm trying. I can't even delete the tab. If you can hear me. Okay. Well, do you want to end it? Huh? You want to end it? Cause I don't think these. <laughs> What's that Sarah? Would you, should we, should we end the show? Because we're, these if you can hear me, what does the timestamp say? Uh, one hour, 31 minutes. Oh God. I know we can do, we can continue next week. You there? No, I'm not here. I'm trying to wait for. I hear you. You hear? Yes, I hear you. Okay, well, let's, okay, well, he's out. So let's go ahead, folks. I think we're going to wrap it up and we will just continue this with a part two next week. So I want to thank everybody for joining us and I will figure out a way to end this stream right now. So love you all. Apologize for the issues. We will fix it before the next show. All right. Thanks, guys.